Good morning, everyone, and welcome again. Uh, my name is Rodney Fong, President and CEO of the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce, as you know, is uh, celebrating 170 years this year, and we represent hundreds, uh, thousands of businesses here in San Francisco in a time that is so much needed. I want to, first of all, thank our sponsor, Waymo, uh, for sponsoring this series. Uh, they've been great members and partners of San Francisco and, as you know, in the autonomous car industry and, and clearly a part of San Francisco's future. Say hello to Waymo, the world's most experienced driver. The Waymo driver is what we call our self-driving technology. It has over a decade of real-world experience and has driven millions of miles. With Waymo One, we can make it safer and easier for you to get around. So you can spend more time doing what you love. And with Waymo Via, the same driver with the same deep experience can also deliver your packages or save you a trip to the dry cleaners. Or if you run a business, Waymo Via can help you transport whatever you need, making sure shipments arrive right when they're supposed to. This is the Waymo driver, a driver that's reimagining transportation for all of us. I want to start by introducing our speaker today, Chris Block of Tipping Point. Uh, I've been very excited. Uh, Chris and I have been in dialogue for months now, actually a year now, uh, since the pandemic, just really talking about the homeless situation, the street life situation. And as we know, it's really important, almost paramount, that San Francisco's street life and, and the, the viability and safety of streets in San Francisco is key to the San Francisco's, San Francisco's recovery um, success. And so that is our first of our list. And we've been working on this obviously before COVID, so is uh, Chris. Um, to introduce Chris, he was the director of, uh, the founding director of Charities Housing Development Corporation in Santa Clara County, where he served as the director there for over 15 years. He was the founding member of the uh, Destination Home, a respected public-private partnership working to reduce homeless in Santa Clara County. And prior to joining Tipping Point, Chris serves as the founding director of the uh, coordinated entry at Episcopal Community Services in San Francisco, and now is with Tipping Point. At Tipping Point, Chris has uh, developed tools to track dashboards to monitor the progress of our homelessness uh, programs in San Francisco, and as you know, we're entering into a, an interesting time where our city's revenues are clearly going to be lower than they were before. And so accountability using data tracking is gonna be really important for us to be able to solve some of our problems going forward. So um, I've enjoyed the, the time I spent with Chris. He brings data and science to the problem uh, and, and is able to uh, help demonstrate where we can best put our efforts and dollars. So with that, Chris, take it away. We're gonna leave some time for question and answers. And so yeah, as you have questions, go ahead and use the chat box, uh, the question and answer box, and we'll get to an open dialogue after Chris's presentation. So Chris, welcome and please take it away. Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and to be with you all. We're gonna, uh, Andrea Feiss, a colleague of mine at the Chronic Homelessness Initiative will present some data. Um, you know, as Rodney indicated, we have um, a significant amount of work that we're doing in uh, transparency and accountability with the department and in the homelessness response system uh, more generally defined. Let me just do 30 seconds on the Tipping Point Chronic Homelessness Initiative uh, five years ago, almost now. Um, the Tipping Point raised $100 million to create a chronic homelessness initiative. We are uh, about 80% through that initiative. Um, and there's three parts to it. The first is that we make leveraged investments in the homelessness response system in San Francisco in an attempt to make that system more effective. Uh, a couple things that we've done of note recently uh, were about 75% done at 833 Bryant which is a per new construction permanent supportive housing development, which we funded. Um, and then the city took us out uh, with financing. That project is 145 units and we're doing it at about a third of the cost of permanent supportive housing in San Francisco and at about half the time. Uh, we also created and funded 
uh, the first round of flexible housing subsidy pool units, which is a scattered side approach to permanent supportive housing. Uh, we funded uh, the first 200 units in a prototype. Before those units have actually been, been placed, the city has committed to quadrupling the size of that program. So again, trying to make leveraged investments that enlarge the solution space around homelessness in San Francisco. We're also doing a lot of work on transparency and accountability, uh, something that quite frankly, the city's uh, uh, homelessness department has struggled with. Uh, and then thirdly, we're doing a lot of larger systems work, particularly as it relates to Prop C. So we have a memorandum of understanding with the controller's office and are taking a, a lead role in creating an investment action plan for Prop C dollars that will be completed. Uh, I tell people whether it kills us or not, and, and it may, but that will be completed by, by April 1st. And that will largely inform uh, the funding for both phases three and four of the shelter in place rehousing plan, as well as the Prop C funding criteria uh, 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 priority Prop C funding priorities for uh, the budget year FY 21-22 most specifically, but also FY 22 and 23 in the two year uh, budget cycle. So that's just a brief overview of our work. Happy to talk more about the chronic homelessness initiative uh, with you all during the question and answer. But most importantly, uh, we wanna give you a snapshot of where we are currently in our efforts to house uh, homeless San Franciscans. Um, and Andrea will present um, uh, some data so that we can uh, inform the conversation that I hope to have with all of you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we have two presentations for you today. I'm gonna to go through them fairly quickly. We are always happy to set another meeting with anyone who wants to delve more deeply into any of this. So we um, provide that open invitation. So the first thing we're gonna walk through is our chronic homelessness um, tracker. As Chris said, the goal of our initiative was to reduce the number of chronically homeless single adults by January 2023. Um, this is in support of the city's stated goal to reduce chronic homelessness among single adults uh, by 50% in 2023. Um, however, what was missing was any sort of tracking progress or predictive tool to monitor us on our way to this goal. So um, in coordination with the Urban Institute, we created this homelessness tracker to do just that. This is an abbreviated version. Um, I can tell you that the full version has a lot more detail. Um, for example, we list and we track in our full version every um, building that is in the city's pipeline for new development for permanent supportive housing. Um, and we track specifically by program type. So I'm gonna quickly go through this just to give you an idea of how we are doing this. So if you look at this spreadsheet, the first line, the chronic pit count, single adults, and then you see four numbers starting in 2020. Um, we predict for each year, the number of chronically homeless single adults. We then, um, we do that by tracking an estimated inflow and tracking outflow. So if we look at the 2020 projection column, you'll see that we predicted based on the methodology I'm gonna go through, um, that there would be 2,943 people in the point in time count. And the point in time count is a biannual census of the number of homeless people in San Francisco. There was no point in time count in 2020. It's done every other year, but we project every year to help keep us on track. So that was our prediction for 2020. We then predict the inflow into chronic homelessness each year. This number was calculate, calculated based on the average number of inflow over the past 10 years in San Francisco. That time period saw both dramatic dips um, and increases in the number of chronically homeless as well as more moderate. 
We then added, when COVID came along, an additional 20% to inflow. This was based on some research out of Columbia University um, to account for possible increases. So as we move down, then in the blue row, you'll see placements. This is where we are predicting um, the number of people who will be placed into housing and thereby exiting chronic homelessness. There are several programs that will do this. Um, permanent supportive housing, site-based. Um, those are master leased or owned buildings that are exclusively permanent supportive housing or majority permanent supportive housing. The flexible housing subsidy pool, this is scattered site permanent supportive housing, meaning people are placed into homes around the city, market rate homes, and they carry with them a subsidy and supportive services. Problem solving, this is the city's um, program for people who are not eligible for permanent supportive housing. Um, and it helps them through um, small amounts of money, mediation, et cetera, it helps them find their own housing. And Rising Up, which is focused on transitional aged youth um, and helps place them into housing. Rapid rehousing, which is a limited subsidy, often for something like two years, and then supportive services. So we calculate based on publicly committed um, placements on behalf of the city. So this is all something that the city said they were gonna do. These numbers are based on that. Um, and we come up with an estimate total placements for 2020, and this is calendar, calendar year, I will say of 1,374. Now we've ended 2020, see so to the left, you will see the 2020 actual of the number and the percent toward the projection. So we can see the actual placements through these programs in 2020 was 886 versus the projected 1,374. So we ended the year 64% towards that projection. As we move down, you'll see another blue row. This is prevention. This is our way of acknowledging that preventing people from entering chronic homelessness is a key strategy for long-term success. The programs listed here um, are all uh, related to tipping point funding, except for the Problem Solving Plus. Um, we are only tracking these because the prevention strategy in San Francisco is really just developing and um, data is a little bit hard to come by. So we restricted it to what we know, knew we could collect. If you go to the total prevention line, you see that our projection was 150. Then to the left, the actual was 126, 84% to goal. So adding this all up, you will see in the red, that we ended the year 66% toward the projection. So we use this methodology across the remaining years of our initiative, adding an inflow and um, calculating outflow. If you look at 2023 projection to the right, you can see that we are still projecting that we can meet the goal, actually exceed it, and there would be 881 chronically homeless single adults versus the 50% reduction target, which was 1,056. I can say in our calculations, we are tracking everything, including um, the city's um, SIP uh, shelter in place hotel rehousing plan. All of those numbers are in here. Um, it's all based on, as I said, publicly estimated slash committed uh, placements on behalf of the city. You know, I, I know that this is a, a huge amount of information and that we're, we're it's a lot. And, uh, but we just, quite frankly, Andrea and I go back and forth with how much we should present. And the reality of it is that if you have a complex problem and you're not willing to kind of present it in its complexity, then there's always really limited understanding. So um, I think probably what we want to do mostly is tell you that we've done the work to make these conclusions and to have this discussion. And as Andrea said, there's behind this an even more significant, uh, obviously, bit of analysis. I think the important thing to see at the end of all of this 
is the figure 881 um, under 2023. And that's important for a number of different reasons. The first is that we focus on chronic homelessness and significant reductions in chronic homelessness for two reasons. The first is because those are the folks that suffer most on the streets. Um, the images you each have of what is a homeless person on the street who's in most distress is the image 90% of the time of a chronic homeless person who's been on the streets a long time um, or who's had multiple episodes of homelessness. Um, the other, and so that's the first reason. Those are the people that suffer most um, and the most important reason. Secondly, is that they cause the most street impacts, that they cause the greatest amount of street impact. Um, and so significant reductions in chronic homelessness means that there'll be a lot less suffering on the streets and there'll be much less uh, impact of, of homeless people on the streets. The reason why getting the number below 1,000 is also important is then you'd have some balance between the shelter system um, and um, and the number of particularly chronic homeless people on the streets who disproportionately access shelters. Uh, and the good news is that if we get that number down significantly below a thousand and more, uh, two things happen. First of all, we spend significantly less resources on chronic homeless people, which allows us to focus on the larger homelessness population. And then secondly, there will be some equilibrium between shelters and chronic homeless folks, which means that most chronic homeless people would be sheltered rather than unsheltered. And again, the importance of that is that they, there would be a significant um, uh, decrease in suffering on the streets. And you'd see uh, a significant improvement, quite frankly, in the quality of streets in San Francisco. Thank you. OK, we can move to the PowerPoint, please. So. We are also tracking um, the um, shelter in place, hotel uh, rehousing and demobilization. So there are about 2000 people that the city placed into the shelter in place hotels as a result of COVID. In December, the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing released a plan for rehousing the residents of those hotels and demobilizing the sites. It's um, divided into four phases. Phase one began in November and all phases are completed at the end of October in terms of rehousing individuals. They estimated the number of people who would be housed in each phase, how they would be housed through what programs. Um, they are presenting data on a public website um, every week, um, which is great. Um, and they're reporting to the Board of Supervisors every week. Um, and those are also available to the public to see. What they do not do, however, is put in context the um, housing, the placements that they make uh, versus the goals that they set out. So uh, we are doing that every week. We are taking the data from um, these, two, um, these two avenues, both the Board of Supervisors reports and the HSH website, um, and we put it into context. So this first slide you're looking- Andrea, What Andrea means by putting it into context, quite frankly, is that we were able to determine whether we're succeeding or failing. I mean, this is the, and we'll talk more about this at the end of our presentation, but this is the missing piece. Um, you have to know when you're going to when you're succeeding based on your stated goals so you can celebrate those successes and do whatever more of whatever made you successful right <laughs> and if you're failing then you need to look at that really honestly and decide why it's not working as you had indicated it would and what we need to do to change so this is um, uh, essential work as far as I'm concerned if we're going to have a system that, that works effectively so this first slide is exits into permanent housing. So tracking the number of people who have been moved out into permanent housing situations. We are tracking here, the data is as of Tuesday. Um, so if you look to the left, the blue bars, the number of actual exits from the beginning of phase one, which is in November. So there have been 123 exits 
the phase one goal is 480 exits. The all phases goal is 2050. So there are still over 1900 people who need to be placed into housing to meet the total goal. Phase one ends end of March. So I think we can safely say we are off pace uh, in terms of this. Next slide, please. Here we're looking at the exits to permanent housing in more detail through which program people are being housed. So if you look to the left, this is permanent supportive housing. So the city projected how many people it would move into permanent supportive housing during phase one. The orange bar is the phase one goal, 190. The total to date is 84. Flexible housing subsidy pool, which is scattered site housing. So people who receive um, placements into market rate units with subsidies and supportive services. The phase one goal is 120, 17 placements to date. Next is rapid rehousing, et cetera. Next slide, please. So we calculated the number of average placements into permanent housing the city would need to make to meet its phase one goal. That weekly average is 24. You'll see eight for the first seven um, weeks. Um, this is because they only started reporting data in January. So they, they um, reported a lump sum for the first few months and I just spread them evenly across the months. But starting in week nine, that's when they started actually reporting. So we can see they started out with 12 a week, um, dipped significantly. Last week they made 16 placements, but it's definitely off pace to meet their goal. Next slide, please. This is taking a look at the overall. So that first bar is the percent through phase one we are. So we are 65% through phase one. The second bar is the number of placements and we are 26% toward the total number of placements for phase one. Next slide, please. We did an analysis. Um, you may be aware that the vacancy um, rate in permanent supportive housing has been an issue in San Francisco, um, meaning that many have felt that the vacancy rate is too high so that units are, being, are sitting empty when people could be placed in them. So this is just an analysis between September of 2020 and January 2021. So the top bar in September, there was a 6% vacancy rate. And in January, there was a 9% vacancy rate. So this is particularly significant because there was a public statement that um, the department would reduce that rate um, significantly. And rather than that happening, the rate has actually gone up. The bars below are simply a, a more detailed analysis on the number that are offline. So in January, 339 were offline. That's usually due to apartments needing maintenance, et cetera. There were 188 open units that were ready and available for referrals, meaning someone could move in. And then there were 213 that were vacant, but there, that were matched to a person and um, was just awaiting move-in. Next slide, please. One of the key pieces um, that um, the department um, has stated that it needs to complete in order to really be successful in rehousing people is um, giving the residents in the hotels an assessment. The assessment is the coordinated entry um, assessment that determines whether a person is eligible for permanent supportive housing. So the department's goal was to have everyone in the SIP hotels assessed by January 31st. We can see as of February 16th, 64, 65% had an assessment, 35% um, still need an assessment. This is important because the assessment determines which housing strategy can be used to move the person out of the SIP hotel and into housing. 
Next slide, please. So we began um, to assess the capacity of the department, the current capacity of the department to actually meet the goals that it has set out. Um, one of the ways we did that is to look at a project that we are funding currently. Tipping Point is funding a flexible housing subsidy pool. We are funding, providing 100% funding for 250 people to be moved into scattered site housing. This program started in July. The goal was to have everyone housed by the end of January. HSH is responsible for finding the people to be referred into the program. So when you see standard referrals, that means a referral is a number, is a person who has said, this person is eligible for scattered site housing and referring them into the program, which obviously is the step that needs to happen before they can be housed. So for the flex pool, there are two types of referrals. I won't get into the difference, but that's why there's two, um, two graphs here. What we can see is that um, the city has been far behind on referring people into this. So if we look at the standard referral slide on the left, um, we were 38% to goal as of the end of January. Most notably and significant about this chart is referrals have gone down between November and January, um, which was alarming to us <laughs> and is really an indication of the city being able to manage the task it has at hand. It is, has been unable to refer into this fully funded program um, the referrals that we need to have. Next slide, please. You know, and again, we realize this is a lot of information and it, it's just important because the city has not done this before, it's just important that we have the, we give you the background. So again, I, I you know, bear with us, but it, we, we feel like it's important to give you this, this background information, you know, but let me just set a little bit of context before we finish. You know, the, the bottom line, and we'll continue to discuss this during the discussion is that, you know, in order to make significant progress, the case that we're making here is that we don't actually have to come up with new programs or new resources and i think this is the if you know if i could make this as clear as possible to folks because i think it's really essential that if if as a city we utilize the resources and fulfill the commitments that we stated right then we could see a significant reduction in chronic homelessness and i just if you carry anything with you as a result of the all of the information we're giving you is that there's a really compelling argument to be made for the fact that we know what to do and we have the money to do it. We just need to implement on that plan. And it's just, I think um, that's where we're gonna talk more about where the advocacy has to come in. Uh, we need to move beyond the idea that we can achieve 65% of our goal as we indicated in the in, in in the chronic homelessness plan, or that we can be at 30% of our shelter in place housing plan. And so our commitment to you is to give you the kind of information where you can have those kinds of active discussions with the people at City Hall and with the other people that are, are in your networks. So thanks. So just one final slide. This is again part of our analysis of capacity. Um, the city participated in a 100 day challenge. The goal was to house 175 people over the 100 days. Um, they were using two different programs. The upshot of this, however, is that um, at February 5th, the challenge period ended and they hadn't made any placements. Um, again, uh, sort of an illustration of uh, where the department is at this point. Um, they seem to be paralyzed um, and um, unable to, to see their way through um, unblocking the bottleneck right now. Um, they are not housing people at a rate that is acceptable um, or that is meeting their own stated um, projections. 
All right, that's the end of our presentations. Again, as Chris said, we went through it very quickly. Happy to discuss this further with anyone should they want to at another time. Yep, yep. Great. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Andrea and Chris. Uh, I fully, fully agree, data is everything. Um, you know, some are even calling this the, the year of data. So hopefully this can help uh, inform, uh, you know, city hall decisions going forward. But, you know, we can take this time now encouraging everyone, if you have questions based on, you know, all of that wealth of information we just received, please just drop them in the chat and we will uh, get to them. I do see two questions to start us off. Uh, Chris, uh, this is a, a large question. Uh, what are your thoughts on conservatorship? I think, um, so I, I, I'm not, um, I'm not opposed, I, I guess, first of all, to say I'm not opposed to conservatorship, or I don't have a, a um, uh, I want to be careful how I say this, because I think that too often there's two camps, you either care about homeless people, so you don't, you don't believe in conservatorship, or you don't care about homeless people, so you believe in conservatorship. And so on that, like so many discussions in San Francisco, it, it really is much more nuanced. So first of all, my position has been, and I certainly, this was borne out by Andrea and I's work in coordinated entry, is that there are a group of homeless people who because of their, um, the length of time they've been on the street and mental health issues, et cetera, have, have seemed to have lost the ability to make good decisions for themselves, at least in the short term. So I think for those folks, there is a role for conservatorship to play. I will say that I think the number is in the low hundreds and not in the low thousands, right? My experience of coordinated entry, I saw some people quite frankly that when they would come in the office, you'd think, man, this person isn't gonna be able to make good decisions and isn't gonna be able to stay housed. And I saw time and time again, how when we engage those folks, got them into a NAV center and then placed them in housing, the success rate throughout the system is about 85 or 90% of people who maintain their housing. So it's not a solution for the vast majority of homeless people because they don't need it. But I, I, but I also believe that to say that no one out there or no one that you see mm -hmm. has not lost the ability, at least in the short term, to make good decisions for themselves, I just, that, it doesn't make sense to me. So I support conservatorship. It's got to have a lot of good safeguards attached to it. And again, it's for, you know, 100 or 200 people uh, in the city, not, not uh, you know, a thousand. Yeah, definitely a, a nuanced, nuanced issue for sure. Um, all right, we have another question here. It's sounding like one of the big problems here is staffing. You have the money, tools, and resources, just not enough people to manage and execute. Is that correct? And if so, are there opportunities for volunteers to help? Um, I, I, I think that at some level, um, so let me just be real upfront at first. I think there's probably limited opportunities for volunteers to help given the, the complexity of this work and the need for people to be engaged in it on a day-to-day -day basis in complex systems. I'm not saying there isn't an opportunity for volunteers. I think it's somewhat limited. Secondly, I will say that while I think it is a staffing issue, because obviously the more money and resources you have, the more staffing you need to spend that effectively. I think that's though not nearly as important as the real challenge we have is one of scaling. I think the biggest challenge the city faces right now, quite frankly, is the idea that we can do a lot more by simply working harder and running faster. And as you all know in business, that's actually not the way that scaling works. And so the city has really struggled to work differently uh, in order to scale up the, um, uh, in order to scale up our activities, both, on, both because of the need and because of the opportunities represented by the increased amount of money provided through Prop C. Um, mm -hmm. So for instance, as one specific example, <clears throat> we're having trouble with referrals throughout the system because we're actually trying to do a lot more and yet we're, we're, we're using the same referral system we did when we were trying to do a lot less with fewer resources. 
And what that has meant is that we're actually doing fewer, fewer referrals than before. And so there's a lot of, I think the good news is there's a lot of active discussion about how we change the referral system to recognize the scale of both the problem and the solutions that we're trying to implement to address that pro those problems. Does that make sense, Emily? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and I guess going maybe uh, also along the lines of that question, um, what do you think uh, as far as hotels being more of a permanent decision? Um, I know the city's facing some of those, um, you know, they're having those discussions around acquisition, um, yep. but what are your general thoughts? This is a good example, I guess, of this scaling issue, actually. So I would generally support more hotel and motel acquisitions, um, but I'll give a couple of caveats, which is why we're hoping that an educated group of people can make, we can have a, a more nuanced uh, discussion in San Francisco. So the first thing I would say um, is that it does make sense to do more hotel and motel acquisitions. As you all know better than I, there's an opportunity now that didn't exist a year ago as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that in order to do that, the city should contract out with a financial intermediary to be able to put those deals together based on some very specific criteria and utilize city funding, ultimately board of supervisors approved to do those motel hotel acquisitions. We don't seem to be making significant progress on hotel motel acquisitions. There's a press conference at 11, as I understand for the community to push that issue. But again, as advocates, if all we do is say to the department in the city, do this, do more of this, do this again, uh, work harder. I have no doubt the people in, in the homelessness department are working hard and that they care a lot. If we're gonna do motel hotel acquisitions in the city as an example, then we're gonna to have to create a new way to do that, working with the mayor's office of housing and community development and probably a locally based financial intermediary in order to put those deals together. The other thing that I would say is that because of the modeling that Andrea largely has done, what we see is that there'll be a point in time when the inflow into chronic homelessness and the number of units that we have based on turnover, and again, I don't want to geek out too much, but that, that, it will, that we'll actually have enough permanent supportive housing in the portfolio to house chronic homeless people throughout the system. What that means is and this again is where it gets a little bit more technical, is that when we buy hotel motels um, in the future, starting now and into the future, we should have affordability restrictions on them <clears throat> that, don't, that don't require that we all always only house chronically homeless people in those hotels, but that it can be used for a larger population of homeless people uh, and disabled people who might have trouble paying the rent under any circumstances, whether or not they were chronically homeless or not. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and I do have a, uh, we have a follow up question to that, but just real briefly, yep. uh, there is a question. How do you define chronic, uh, chronic homelessness, the same as the city, um, or do you have your own definition? Uh, we define it the same as the city. Gotcha. All and right. the, same as the state and the federal government, and uh, mm -hmm. there's a pretty standard definition. Got it. Um, all right. And um, so it sounds like, you know, uh, not that there's, <laughs> there's no silver linings in COVID really, but there are other opportunities, you know, like with these hotels that you're saying, uh, we do have a question, uh, you know, it sounds like there's some opportunities, but has COVID pushed, um, pushed back on you on your goals at all? Um, how has COVID, you know, impacted tipping points goals and, you know, the homeless population at large? Yeah. So you know, we've been at this for almost a year now. And so we need, I think, to move beyond the idea that somehow we're not able to accomplish our goals because of COVID. Um, if we haven't yet responded to the crisis, that's on us, not on the virus. So I think that um, even with COVID, we have the plan in place, what Andrea described, the shelter in place housing plan, uh, the, the, the overall intervention strategies around chronic homelessness, um, we should not use COVID as an excuse for not meeting our goals and addressing the issue. We've been at it too long and we're coming out of it in some ways. Um, I will say though that when we present the data, <clears throat> the bad news is it looks like a system that is, has seized up to some degree. And I think there's some truth to that. 
then as the system got more resources and it tried to scale up, it actually uh, froze up uh, as a result of um, uh, what has so far been a pretty sluggish attempt to scale. Here's the good news <laughs> that gives me a lot of hope for the fact that we're gonna move through this, that we're gonna get more referrals, that we're gonna reduce the vacancy rate, that we're gonna meet our objectives. And here's the, I think, important, another important thing for people on the call to realize. First of all, we have 2000 people in shelter in place hotels. Everyone knows where they are. Everyone knows the commitment that's been made for those folks. The reality of it is if those folks were on the street, it would be easier, I don't wanna to say to ignore them, but at least easier to lose track of them, perhaps. The second thing is that, that because Prop C is a locally uh, uh, generated source of dollars, as you all know, the dollars keep accumulating, right? So we have a situation now where we've got a whole group of people that we know where they are, and we know that we have a commitment to housing them, and we have a billion dollars lying around. So that creates an opportunity and quite frankly, a tension that has to be resolved, right? We have to find a way to use those billion dollars to house those 2000 people. There is no alternative nor should there be. Uh, and, and so that gives me a lot of hope. I will say, I'm sorry to go on and on about this, but I, I will say that um, I believe that you will start to see, and, and to the degree that you all can play a role in this, I think it would be helpful. Um, I, I know it would be helpful, you know, when we started putting people in hotels, I think for all the right reasons, we said, boy, once you get somebody in a hotel, they should never leave back to the streets. Yeah. That actually has created two unintended consequences. Uh, there has been some hesitancy with some people about leaving the hotels. Uh, justify, I, I mean, I understand that. Uh, meals are provided in hotels. Every hotel room has a bathroom. Um, you know, there's lots of reasons why, particularly if you've been homeless for a long time, you'd be hesitant to leave a hotel, uh, particularly if the options are not clear about leaving that hotel and what are the available options when you leave. Um, uh, secondly, it's created the unintended consequence of focusing all our resources on people or, or who are already in hotels, leaving behind a lot of street homeless who may actually have a greater need for housing. So I think what you're gonna see in the shelter in place housing plan over time, at least I hope this is what you'll see, um, that in order to free up the system, to unstick the system, to increase the flow, I think that people in hotels will start uh, being offered, I hope, a couple of options on permanent housing. And if they don't accept those options, right, um, then they, they will not necessarily get housing as a result of their hotel stay. And I think the second thing you'll see is that there'll be a greater emphasis on current street homeless and getting some of those people housed as well. My hope is that we'll maintain this 2000 person commitment that we have, right? We've got 2000 people in hotels. We've committed to housing 2000 homeless people by October 1st. Let's maintain that commitment. They may not all be from the shelter in place hotels. Uh, because we found that that has a couple, as I've explained, a couple of unintended consequences. Does that make sense? That... Yeah, yeah, definitely. So definitely. when you hear that we're, we're going to change the policy a little bit, mm -hmm. don't assume that that's because we're, we're trying to house less people or it's a bait and switch. It's just understanding what we know now. I think as Andrea presented, we can house 2,000 people by October 1st we just can't say no matter what we're going to have a guaranteed housing slot for everyone in the hotel um because that has all sorts of implications that i think have been uh, that have created barriers that makes sense yeah and very different situations for everyone i'm sure yep. Yep. um all right here we have um a question uh about federally funded cities um you know i think we, we are seeing some more federal dollars coming in now but um they bring up the roosevelt new deal program uh so to have a federally funded cities um they've been developed across the nation uh, providing tiers of services and housing you know considering how uh large of a crisis that is in san francisco what are your thoughts on that um you know um 
my thought now in San Francisco is I think everyone involved in the homelessness response system, Andrea and I included, um, should be very public about two things. First of all, we should apologize to everyone that it's taken us so long to address this issue and that we haven't done it effectively yet. Because that is um, uh, completely unacceptable. And I'll just, that's on my part, on, on my, my failure to effectively address the issue is unacceptable. And I think that we should then acknowledge that at least for the next few years, um, we have the necessary resources to effectively address homelessness in San Francisco. And if we don't, it's because we have failed to do our job, not because we don't know what to do or have the resources to do it. And I think we should just particularly those, I think we should all take responsibility for that in San Francisco, particularly the people like myself that are actually in the system. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't need federal dollars. Uh, it just means that we don't have to assume that we have to wait for those dollars to achieve some real changes um, in both the conditions for homeless people in San Francisco and the conditions of streets in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you don't see any improvement in a year, it's because I and everyone else in the system have failed, not because we don't have the resources. Well, um, I will say, you know, on behalf of the chamber and our members, we very much appreciate all the work that you're doing. It is uh, very important work. Um, uh, I guess we have two questions here. They're both kind of definition based. Uh, can you explain the actual steps that go into a referral? Uh, I can't. I'm just not sure how helpful it is, given it's not working. I, I mean, you know, I think that here's what we have to acknowledge. Um, we have probably if you add it all up with flex pool, permanent supportive housing, we have at least 750 to 1000 available units today. Let's say 500 to 1000 available units today. We know where there's 2000 homeless people. At the very least, we know where those 2000 are. And we have a city that's seven square miles. So the fact that we have significant vacancies in flexible housing and permanent supportive housing is just a collective failure by the system. And there are reasons I can get into the technical reasons of the step-by-step -step referral process and why it's not working. I can talk about how we, we feel like we need to give greater access to providers to actually the, 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 the one system, the database for homeless people and do batch referrals. So a provider is given 50 referrals and say, listen, here's 50 people that need housing. Just house those 50 people in whatever order you find um, that they're available rather than trying to do individual placements. Um, and I think that will make a big difference. Um, I think having some clarity in the SIP hotels, you get two choices. If you don't accept those two choices, then you're not offered housing any longer as, an, as another way to speed the process through. Um, that all being said, we are, we're working hard and we're focused on that. Um, and, you know, we better get it right. Otherwise, you all should find other people to do this work. Because like I said, there's 500 to 1,000 vacant units. Um, uh, uh, there's 2,000 people in hotel rooms, uh, and it's a seven in, in seven square miles, and 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 it's, so it's it's um, yeah. There are there are a couple reasons things we think we can do to recognize the, the current reality and increase the flow, um, and that has a lot to do with actually. I won't go any further into this, but it has a lot to do with removing steps. You know, when you have limited resources and limited units available, you can do, you can have a lot of steps and you can do re referrals one at a time. Uh, if you have a lot of resources and you need to house a lot of people in a hurry, you can no longer do one referral at a time. You've got to batch those referrals and, and, and take away the steps in the process. Otherwise, it takes too long given the number of people you have to house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Um, all right. Well, before I pass it off to Rodney uh, for some closing remarks, do you have any, um, you know, closing statements or anything else you'd like to, to share with us? Uh, you know, I, I will. The one thing I'll leave you with is uh, stay informed. Uh, it's a new era in San Francisco's homelessness response system. We have the data. 
Uh, we can show you where we're succeeding and where we're failing. Uh, and also just leave, I hope if you leave today with anything, it is the belief that, um, that we can actually address this issue effectively. We have the resources, we know the intervention strategies that work, we've got the necessary infrastructure in San Francisco. It's just utilizing that infrastructure differently. Um, it's use, utilizing those um, resources more effectively, and it is making sure that we're over uh, the time when we commit to housing 1,800 people in 2020, we house 1,300. Um, we need to move beyond that approach, and um, and we have the resources and the infrastructure to do that. Um, so that's the good news. Hold us accountable to achieving those things, please. Well, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Chris and, and Andrea, for a very you know open, honest conversation. We are very grateful for this data and all of your insight. Um, so I'll pass it off to Rodney for some closing remarks. Great, thank you, Emily, appreciate it. Chris and Andrea, very much, thank you so much for uh, all of this. And, and I think it's okay to geek out on this, Chris. Uh, <laughs> this is a time when we need to geek out. This is a, uh, a critical topic at a critical time of San Francisco. And as we mentioned, <clears throat> so much important of, uh, to, to place such a huge role in the, our full recovery of San Francisco. I uh, wanna thank Waymo for sponsoring this particular uh, event and others that are coming up on a monthly basis at this City Hall check-in. As you see on this screen here, we have executive coffee breaks coming up. We have a, our next uh, session of this City Hall check-in is with Supervisor Mendelman. We have a discussion on California high-speed rail, all the more important right now, a focus on small business, and of course our Bayshoff Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame uh, event coming up on March 4th. So stay tuned. I recognize, I used to be able to say I, I recognize a lot of new faces in the room. Uh, this time with Zoom, I recognize, I recognize a lot of new names on the list. So if you're not a member of the Chamber of Commerce and want to check it out, sfchamber.com. We are a nonprofit. This is kind of the KQED message. We are funded by you guys. We are doing work for you, doing work for the business and nonprofit community of San Francisco. So your membership is so important. Um, Want to just again thank uh, Chris and Andrea for for speaking today, um, and my my final thoughts. So Chris, you know it's it's all of our fault really. We've we've allowed um, this problem uh, in an inhumane way to take over our city. It's all of our faults for not bringing it up. Uh, you are providing information and data for all of us to have talking points uh, in conversations, casual or formal. And I think it is time that San Francisco as a whole, from all aspects, walks of life to San Francisco, bring up this problem and try to solve it in the most humane way uh, as possible. So thank you for your work. We are going to be hopefully megaphones for your, your work and hopefully you can be megaphone for the Chamber of Commerce. Thank and, you. Uh, appreciate it, okay? All right, thanks everyone. And we'll see you next time.